What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, the last part of our series on modern physics. This one's going to deal with relativity. i got to be honest with you guys. This stuff today, it, it makes my brain just melt. It's insane the things that Einstein was thinking of when he came up with his special theory of relativity. It's re- it really is awesome stuff. This is going to be surface level stuff, guys. So based on the SAT physics exam, maybe an advanced high school physics course, or maybe just your first year 101 basic, you know, nothing too crazy. We're going to talk about the, the concepts of special relativity, the laws of physics, you know, within a reference frame and the effects of speed, specifically as we approach the speed of light on time, mass, and also length. And I'm chuckling because just thinking about it just makes my mind melt. Let's let's just dive right into it really quickly. So just to recap, in the beginning of modern physics, in the first couple of videos that we made, we talked about how things really started to change right at 1900. You know, with different experiments, we started to understand the atom and nuclear reaction. Well, five years later, Einstein published four different papers One of them got him the Nobel Prize in 1921, and that was for the photoelectric effect, which now has turned into solar, which is insane, you know, literally 100 years later. Another paper that did not win the Nobel Prize, but was just equally as important in changing physics forever, was a paper on special relativity. Okay, and this special relativity was a series of experiments to try and understand the behavior of objects that are traveling near the speed of light. So just as a recap, guys, the speed of light is C. It's 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And what he was finding out is that at these speeds, or very close to it, time, length of the object, and mass were all going to change. Now, I also want to mention that Einstein also has a general theory of relativity. This is not that. (laughs) To be honest, guys, the general theory of relativity is so advanced that I don't even want to think about it. So there's two different relativities that we're going to be talking about. And really the only difference that we're going to see between the special relativity and the general theory is how the object is moving and, and its frame of reference In the special theory of relativity, everything is going to be moving at a constant speed. Okay, so that's going to be first a a very, very important thing for us to understand first. Now, before 1905, we believed that inside space was something called ether. And this was just an invisible medium. We learned in sound and with waves that a medium is something that waves can propagate through. We just couldn't understand the fact that light, which we thought was a wave, which we now know acts as a wave and a particle could travel through space if there was no medium. But in all the experiments, we could not prove that ether existed. Every single experiment that they tried to make that proved that there was ether failed. And that's really what Einstein's special theory of relativity was coming into play. He wanted to explain why all the experiments were failing and why there was no ether. So there's going to be a couple different parts to this special theory, but the main thing that he said was, and he suggested that light is the same for all inertial reference frames. So that's going to be some vocabulary right off the bat. So let me just write that out real quick. And what this is, it's a reference frame moving at a constant speed. And it has this word inertial in it because inertia is just a resistance to want to keep moving or staying at a constant speed. Even though it's stopped, you know, an object at rest will remain at rest until moved by an outside net force, that's still a constant speed of zero. So... When we have an inertial reference frame, the object is going to be moving at a constant speed. And what he said is the speed of light is the same for all of this. And this is super counterintuitive. Let me explain why. We know from kinematics, dynamics, and all of our motion that if you're moving in a car that's going 60 miles per hour and you throw a pumpkin out the window, how fast is that pumpkin going to be moving once it exits the car? Well, it's going to be moving 60 miles per hour. Right? Because when the pumpkin's inside, it's mo- everything's moving together. So the speed of the pumpkin is really how fast the car was moving. And then if you threw it forward, you would increase that. Well, what this is saying to us is that if you have a car that's traveling 60 meters per second, 60 miles per hour, whatever it is, the speed of light coming out of the headlights is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second 
always. It doesn't matter if the car is stopped. It doesn't matter if it's moving forward at a constant speed. And it does not matter how fast it's moving at a constant speed. This speed of light does not change if the inertial reference frame is there. And this led to what we call the first postulate of special relativity. And what it says is that all the laws of physics are the same for any inertial reference frame. And what we just spoke about earlier is the second postulate. And what it says is even if light is emitted from a moving source, it only travels the speed of light. Okay, so guys, what you really need to take away from this is if you see there's a moving light source, what you need to know is that even though the light is coming from a moving light source, it's still only going to travel C. If you throw a baseball out of a car forward 10 miles per hour and the car is moving 60 miles per hour, that ball will in fact be moving 70 total, 60 from the car, 10 from throwing it. But if a car is traveling at 60 miles per hour and the light comes out of the headlight, we don't add that 60 miles per hour to the speed of light. The speed of light C is going to be the same for all objects inside our inertial reference frame. So now let's take a look at how moving at speeds close to the speed of light affects time, length, and mass. First, time. Now guys, for each one of these time, mass, and length, I'm going to give you a formula which could really, really sound confusing. I wouldn't worry so much about using the formulas or solving for them, but more understanding how time, length, and mass are affected as we approach the speed of light. So that's more what I want the takeaway to be. You need to be able to say, what happens to time in reference to an observer as I approach the speed of light, and et cetera, for mass and for length. Okay, so don't worry. The, the formulas can look intimidating. Don't worry too much about the formula. The time formula that I want to write is T equals T naught over the square root of 1 minus V squared divided by C squared. Now let's talk about what this means. First and foremost, we have an observer, somebody that's watching an object, and then we have a moving object. Okay, so all these are going to be in relation to some observer observing a moving object and what happens to time, length, and mass as this observer observes the moving object. So let's say that there's an observer that's stationary, right? That's a constant speed. And then we have somebody that's moving at a constant speed and both of these people are holding clocks. Now the observer will observe their clock looking exactly the same. Nothing changed. It's running as normal. But as the moving object approaches the speed of light, its clock will appear to run slower. Okay, this is called time dilation. All right, so this, let's break down this formula using that vocabulary. This is the time dilation. This is the time of the observer. Time on observer's clock. Okay, so this one is just a normal running time, normal running clock. Okay, so now this observer with their normal clock is going to observe an object that's moving at some speed. And it's going to be 1 minus that speed divided by c squared. That is going to be the time dilation that the observer sees the moving object going. So you can see for very low speeds, right, where this is pretty much close to zero. As we're at zero, then for slow speed, all right, slow speeds, we can see that t is pretty much t naught. We're not going to see time dilation at very, very slow speeds, which is why we don't notice it because we don't travel anywhere near close to the speed of light. But now let's look at like a really, really high speed. Let's say if V was like 0.995C, really, really close to 1C. Well, now we would see what would happen is we'd have T equals T naught divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, t divided by 1 minus 0.995 divided by 1. The c squareds would just cancel out, right? This was v squared, so I see that c squared. So we see that that's really about 10 
T0. So to an outside stationary observer, the events in the moving frame appear to take 10 times as long as the same events in the observer's standard reference frame. So essentially, the observer is looking at this moving object, right? If this person can move 0.995C, the clock and the person in the moving object would appear to be moving in slow motion. And even crazier, if it could move the speed of light, then the clock would appear to stop entirely. So here's the takeaway right here. As we approach the speed of light, time seems to slow down to zero, and here's just the proof of that. All right, let's look at what happens to length. And guys, if you're thinking to yourself, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> it's, it's, it's all right. Don't worry about it so much. Just know that as we approach the speed of light, if the object is moving at a constant speed, time will slow to a stop if it can match the speed of light. Here's the next formula for length. And here's the takeaway right away, and then I'll show you the proof. As an object moves towards the speed of light, it appears to contract. But now there's a little bit of an addition here. It appears to attract only in the direction or the axis of motion. And here's what I mean. Let's say I had a block, and we see this block right here, and it was moving close to the speed of light. So its V was pretty close to C. And it was moving in this direction here. Well, this is along the x-axis. So, to an outside observer, the box would appear to look like something like this. Right? It stayed the same height in the y-axis. Right? These are the same because the direction of motion or the direction of speed is in the x-axis. So this thing actually contracted this way as it appeared to an outside observer. At, at a slow speed, once again, we'd see that L equals L naught. So this would be the length that it's contracted, and this would be the length of the object if it were at rest. So I remember reading back in college one day, like a fast car, like a race car, it actually has a length that's contracted by like the size of like one atom, the diameter of an atom. So we obviously we would never notice that. But like I said, when we're going fast, like say we can have a spaceship that was going really, really fast, like capable of like almost traveling the speed of light. An observer like looking at that spacecraft, it would perceive the whole entire spacecraft would shrink to a really, really small point in the direction of motion. And we'd see that when V is equal to C, then L would be equal to zero. And that's when we get into multiple dimensions and things like that and our brain begins to fry. So in the risk of frying our brain, we'll just remember, here's the takeaways. As I approach the speed of light, my length is going to contract, but only in the direction of motion. I've seen this multiple choice question on many SAT exams, and they'll give like a bunch of different blocks. They'll make it shrink down in all different directions, guys. Only in the axis of motion will it contract. Last, we'll look at mass and what happens to mass as an object approaches the speed of light. Here's the formula, m equals its initial mass at rest, 1 minus v squared over c squared. So from seeing this, as v goes up, m is also going to go up. You become more massive as you approach the speed of light. And guys, this is an actual change in mass. Remember, this is just a relationship between the observer and the moving object. So this lowercase m, not m naught, m is the increased mass that a station of stationary observer would perceive, okay? So the mass actually isn't going up. M0 is the object's rest mass. So like I said, once again, guys, this is a relative change between an observer and an object. Remember back to the Doppler effect, we talked about the apparent change in frequency caused by the relative motion between the source of the wave and its observer. Once again, we're looking at an observer and a perceived change of that object. The mass actually doesn't go up. The perceived mass does. And once again, at low speeds, m is just equal to the perceived change of mass. So that's not going to be that noticeable for people like us. But as we get to c, when v equals c, the mass will perceive to be infinite. And guys, this is what tells us that we can't go any faster than the speed of light. We remember from Newton's second law, f equals ma. So if I have an infinite amount of mass, then I would need an infinite amount of force to accelerate that object. And since infinity is not really a number, we can't do that. So C is the speed limit in our universe for how fast something can travel. 
And of course, guys, that's as of now. Maybe one day one of you will prove that otherwise. You'll win a Nobel Prize and you'll be a millionaire and go on to science fame. So guys, the takeaways from this, if you see a moving light source, the speed of that light is the same for all observers in an inertial reference frame, which is C equals three times 10 to the eighth meters per second squared. And this does not depend on the movement of that object. It always is going to be C. We're going to remember that for time dilation, a clock on a moving object will appear to run slowly in terms of the observer. In length contraction, the length will be affected and it will move only in the direction of the axis and the mass will increase. All right, A moving object will appear larger than its rest mass. And the effects of this time dilation, this length contraction, and this mass increase, at slow speeds, they're irrelevant, okay? And it doesn't really matter too much. All we worry about is that we, as we get close to the speed of light. For the entire modern physics unit, guys, here's the playlist on that. I will post it right here. Up here, I'll leave all the SAT2 content. And click right here if you want to subscribe and support the channel for future content. Hope you guys have an awesome day.